let's get started. Is this on? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Duke. Welcome to our conference. I can't tell you how fabulous it is to see you here. Um, as you probably know, I'm Catherine Fisk. Uh, Me Too Gulati and I started talking about this conference just about the time that he came to Duke. And it, it began like one of those old Busby Berkeley musicals, sort of, you know, they're Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland or whoever are sitting around talking and they say, let's put on a show. <laughs> And then you sort of cut, and then suddenly, you know, there they all are, dancing and singing. Um, and this is exactly how I feel about this. That started out thinking, gee, this is so interesting. The Jesperson case is such a fascinating vehicle for talking about everything having to do with equality, discrimination, identity, employment. And so we thought, well, let's get a few people together. We had no budget. Um, we didn't ask for a budget, I suppose. We, but we said, we'll just get a few people to come to town and we'll sit around and chat and then we'll have dinner at your house afterwards. And suddenly, all of you just sprang up and really made this a fabulous event. Um, and our thought is that we'd like to keep it in a way in the sort of vision that we began with of let's just put on a show or let's sit around and have a conversation all day. Um, and particularly because this event has grown with so many wonderful scholars who know so much more about this field than I do, willing to come and share your work. It's simply not going to be possible, of course, for each of you to deliver your paper, those of you who've written a paper for the symposium issue of the Duke Gen Journal of Gender Law and Policy. Nor <laughs> <laughs> Nor is it uh, going to be possible for those of you who aren't writing for this symposium but who have written so much to sort of talk about all of your work because that would take three days and we really don't have a budget for that and you definitely don't since of course you're paying for it. Um, so our thought is, is this is going to be a day-long roundtable and kind of as I warned you, um, we'll have a series of sessions which we deliberately did not title or try to organize by theme because we weren't sure exactly which way the conversation would go as each of you came together to talk. Um, but we'll have a sort of series of conversations which will be led by the various panels that we have put together with moderators whom we have empowered to make sure that you talk for only about five to seven minutes uh, while you're doing your presentation of whatever it is you want to talk about for five to seven minutes. And then whose job it is to spark a conversation among the panelists and among the group as a whole. For our students in the room, uh, we are expecting you to, to chime in and, and participate in the conversation as well. Don't let all us professors and lawyers talk over you. Um, and so that's sort of the agenda for the day. Um, there are a number of people in the room without whom this event would not have been possible. One of them, of course, is our Dean, Kate Bartlett, who we'll talk in just a minute. But perhaps less visible, at least to the world at large, although very visible to you, are uh, the students and administrative staff who made this event possible. First of all, I cannot thank enough Balfour Smith, whom I know all of you have emailed with. And I think Balfour snuck out of the room. So we're going to thank Bal for later. He is not going to get out of here without us acknowledging and clapping and whistling and cheering. If without him, this really would not have happened. He's really exceptional. And also, the, the student editors and the student staff of the Duke Journal of Gender Law and Policy, who did amazing things, including raising money to fund the things that you all aren't paying for and the things that Kate is not paying for. Um, obviously making the symposium issue of the journal work and you know getting you rides from the airport, all of that. I really want to thank them to acknowledge their initiative in doing this, the intellectual engagement they've had with these issues. And also they're running a lot of the logistics of this. In particular, I'd like to single out Ryan Higgins, who's the editor in chief of the journal, and Kim and Kim Kisabeth, who is the symposium editor of the journal, and get one or the other of them to come up and just talk a little bit about some of the other logistics before Kate then welcomes us substantively. Ryan, Kim, who is it? Hey, 
Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for being here. And on behalf of the Duke Journal of Gender Law and Policy, we would, speaking of clapping and cheering, like to thank uh, Professors Fisk and Gulati and Dean Bartlett for making this day possible. They've been amazing friends, mentors, and of course, professors to all of us. And we appreciate it more than they could ever know. We'd also like to thank Balfour Smith, who is amazing. And we can't thank him enough for dealing with the logistics of this. And our sponsors, Cole Amoring and McKee Nelson. And to the editors of the journal for all of their hard work picking people up at the airport and um, for the future work that they'll do for all of your papers to get those published. <laughs> so for logistics, as Professor Fisk said, you'll speak no more or you'll speak around five to seven minutes for each panel, and then there will be a dialogue with the audience. It's intended to be informal, just an interesting, fun discussion among very, very, very intelligent people. So we're all looking forward to it, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. I want to add my welcome to those you've already received. It's, it's uh, really interesting to hear the story of this conference. Um, as you may know, Catherine and Me Too are fairly new to Duke Law School, but she tells a very plausible story, and it's a story that kind of related why we're so happy to have them around. Um, they, they, don't, they don't seem to recognize uh, barriers. Uh, they have ideas, and it's just assumed <laughs> that somehow it will happen. Um, uh, um, th this is, you know, for a low budget conference, uh, there's a lot going on here. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a better set of papers for a conference as, as this one. It's really a fabulous uh, set of papers. Uh, I was telling my, the students when I came in, um, they ought to be really pleased, uh, and I think they're going to really, really enjoy working with those. Who made this poster? <laughs> this is a really cool poster, Ryan. Thank you. I mean, this is, I, want, I want this poster somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, if it would fit in my living room, but, um, <laughs> but maybe some living room around here it will fit. Really, really, really glad to have all of you here. You made this conference possible, obviously. I hope you have enough time while you're here to wander around the building. We're really proud of all of the different renovations and additions. Uh, if you don't have time to see the whole building, one of the things we're most proud of is the new wing uh, on the second floor, one floor down. Uh, our, a number of our clinics are consolidated in one law office clinic uh, space, which is really beautiful. And right below them is the, uh, are some uh, journal offices, including uh, the, the uh, gender law and policy uh, journal office. So um, look around. Um, uh, lots to see at Duke. If you haven't been to Duke before, I hope you can get a chance to wander around the campus. Uh, I don't know how late you're staying, but um, uh, you will be entertained if you stay for the Miami-Duke football game tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> we, look, we look for people to fill up that stadium wherever we can find them, and I, I can report to the president that I you know, pitched it at the, uh, at the uh, Makeup Identity Performance and Discrimination Conference. <laughs> Probably get lots of points for that. Um, <laughs> This is obviously a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I did write everything I had to write about it about 10 years ago, and so, and haven't um, returned to it as a scholar since, so it's really been fascinating for me to, to look through these papers and to see um, how, how far um, and, and how much further and, 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 and how many directions this topic has been uh, deepened and, and strengthened and, and in a way confused because there's just, uh, uh, you know, it's, it seems simpler 10 years ago. Um, we don't really know what, what we don't like about the dress and appearance um, regulations and rules that we see, at least not, not as a group. We don't, we, it's hard to agree on what exactly it is that when we see something we don't like. Um, why, we, why we don't and why something else that may seem otherwise uh, to a judge similar uh, would be something that we might agree, well, yeah, that's okay, but, but, but not that. And so I think one of the, uh, in this rolling conversation, which unfortunately I'm only going to be part of this morning because I have a mandatory dean's retreat to go to, but um, um, really, really hoping that, that uh, I learned some things this, this morning about uh, kind of where we are on even defining what the problem is. Um, 
it, it seemed, uh, uh, well, th actually this confusion existed even, even 10 years ago. Um, I think most people then, but not all, saw it as a sex equality issue, that is to say employers can say what people need to wear, but they can't say it in a way that makes it more difficult um, for, for women than men to comply. And, and of course, that treating it as an equality issue only begged the question of what will you do with it as an equality issue? Does that mean you don't have any, any sex-specific dress and appearance regulations? You just say everybody has to do, wear the same thing. That never seemed very satisfactory to too many people. Um, uh, but then what, what that brought us to was a test along the lines of the unequal burdens test that a, num a number of you write about in your papers, which seems also unsatisfactory on many grounds. Um, then there's the line of analysis uh, that Catherine Fisk's work is a part of. I think in a, in a way Carl Clare uh, began this some years ago, uh, thinking of it as it's not really, what we object to is not really so much that men and women are treated differently maybe, but that they're confined in this way at all, or at least that they're confined in some of the ways that employers have, have chosen to, to restrict what employers, or what, what employees can wear, what they look like, makeup, and so on. Uh, but even then, we have lots of choices about what it is we're trying to protect in the individual. What is this autonomy ish, interest? Um, um, is it, is it, um, it, you know, free to do whatever you want? Uh, lots of people, including people in this room, have wrote it, written about it as in terms of some sort of authenticity that an individual ought not to have be a, be asked to violate. Uh, but then, of course, there's a question of where this sense of auth authenticity comes from, given all of the forces that work on us to make us think we are who we think we are, uh, including, of course, some of those forces are the very dress and, and appearance standards uh, that are on the table. So it's a, it's a very circular, very um, um, fluid field. It, it's not too unlike a number of other fields in the sex discrimination law where they're uh, neither an autonomy theory nor a privacy theory or any of their possible versions seems to circle the whole problem. It seems like you, you want to pull out one tool for one instance and, and another for another. Um, certainly debates about even the, the, the right to choose, abortion, lots of back and forth between equality and autonomy analysis. Sexual harassment law has a very deep literature, very rich literature now, as you know, between these theories and versions of these theories um, pregnancy in a somewhat different way, also conflict about exactly what it is that we are trying to protect here. So um, I think we're all here because we think that this is an important uh, topic. Um, I wanted to, to start uh, with apologies who may already, uh, with, to people who may have already read the story, but it is my absolute uh, favorite story, and I started my uh, Michigan Law Review article uh, 1994, with this story, but in the event you haven't yet heard it, I want to put it on the table as my introduction. Uh, and I left it over there, but I think I can do it from the top of my head. Uh, this is the Sandra Bem story about her, uh, I think, three-year-old uh, son who, who insisted on going to nursery school with a barrette in his hair, and she tried to talk him out of it, but to no avail, so he goes to nursery school and people start calling him a girl. And he, um, he resists that, he says, I am not a girl, I'm not a girl, yes you are a girl, you've got a barrette in your hair, no I'm not a girl, he finally pulls down his pants and says, here, look, you can see I'm a boy, and, and to which his antagonist says, everybody has one of those, only girls wear barrettes. <laughs> and, um, it's a it's a really moving, you know, as only stories involving children can be, testament to how um, important and how much we judge and evaluate people based on what we know and on one side of ourselves is only an exterior, superficial uh, uh, adornment or or dress or or way we do our hair or whatever, uh, but is so basic uh, to how we define uh, ourselves and each other. Uh, and, and so what do we do about, I, I'm not sure I know anything else quite like it, where it seems so trivial and important at the same time. So, um, so I look forward to this conversation. Um, I expected my panelists up here by now, but how, how do we do this? Uh, <laughs> Come on down.
tweet. Scoot in. <laughs> yeah, they're they're oh, I'm sorry. And I'm so floating in at the last minute this morning that I haven't even met my panelists. So if you'll just <laughs> indulge me for a moment. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Joel Friedman. Yeah, nice to meet you. So I've heard about these folks and. You're one of my graduates. I am. Yeah, okay. I yeah. am a so. proud graduate and proud former member of the Gender Journal. Uh, one of the founding members, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so we're um, we're going to be short on introductions, uh, and and uh, in a way, uh, uh, I hope that people, when they speak and join in on the conversation, will introduce themselves. We want to know uh, our names, and I think this is a this is a. A, a group where so many of the names, including names up here, are familiar, familiar to us. But I think I'll go ahead and introduce everyone at once, uh, and then we'll uh, take turns with the, um, the, the the main restriction we're working here with this morning is um, is five minutes each, five to seven minutes each. So I'm the police on that, and then we will get some questions on the table. I was going to write on the board, but I'm not going to write on that. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and involve the audience. So um, we could actually go in the order that these introductions happen to have been handed to me. So how about that, since we haven't discussed an order. Um, uh, first, Professor Friedman. Uh, Joel William Friedman is the Jack Gordon Professor of Procedural Law and Jurisdiction and Director of uh, a Tulane ITESM PhD program, which um, uh, I'm you don't have security clearance enough for me to explain what that is. Okay, good, good. I met a whole lot of Tulane students last night. They got a big prize for their, for their uh, hurricane relief project. Huh. Great group of, great group. Morgan Sullivan, do you know the name? Anyway. Um, Professor Friedman, um, everybody here is an expert in employment law, employment relations, uh, sex discrimina uh, discrimination law of some version or another. So I'm going to pick out um, other interesting things. And, and for me, for Professor Friedman, it is that he was formerly the drummer for the Walking Dogs, <laughs> a New Orleans rock and roll band, uh, and has appeared in the New Orleans Opera Association uh, version production of Aida. Um, common to this group is uh, many teaching awards. So I expect great presentations today because we have some master teachers here. Um, Raphael Gelli is um, on the faculty at the University of Cincinnati. Um, his prize here that's noted as faculty member of the year. I'll have to learn about what that is. Um, that's probably for things like starting conferences like this and, and making them happen. Um, and also a number of publication prizes uh, as a specialist in labor law and labor relations. Um, Mike Selmy is... Um, on the faculty at GW, um, he has, be before entering academia, he litigated employment discrimination cases at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights uh, Division, he worked on a number of Supreme Court cases, and um, probably of all of us up here is the one you most often would hear on radio or television. So um, he's, the, he's the another kind of rock star. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca uh, Springer is from, um, wor works at Crowell and Mooring on labor and employment litigation, and particularly in the area of Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. She is the only Duke Law School graduate up here, and as she noted, um, worked on the, um, was an editor for the Duke Journal of Gender Law and Policy, and was also a real star in terms of our um, moot court programs, so we're really glad to have her back. Uh, Kim Urock. I knew I was going to say this wrong. Kim Urako, okay, uh, from Northwestern. I've been um, following her work closely for uh, the last several years. Um, her primary area is in anti-discrimination law um, um, and gender equity, and um, really is in a very short time becoming a very well-known scholar in this area. So glad to have all these folks here. And um, Joel, I think we started with you, so. Oh, huh, well, okay. <laughs> Take out your notes and... Uh, well, here are my notes. <laughs> <laughs> notes are taken out. <laughs> it's very nice. I see I'm at Tulane University School of Law School. And, you know, considering everything that's gone on at Tulane, you know, to have an extra title is, a, you know, is already a plus. Well, thank you very much. For, I, I want to thank uh, Me Too for inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. I was very excited when we talked about it a long time ago. Uh, 
I want to thank Catherine for scheduling this two weeks after the World Beer Festival that was held in Durham. Uh, you all, I'm sure, were very disappointed that we missed. Did you know that there was a World Beer Festival? I heard it was great, but that the football game tomorrow will be better. <laughs> yeah, well, makeup may be a very interesting word when the Miami football team comes on the field, but that's a whole other issue. Um, uh, I'm going to take uh, about two out of my seven minutes, and you can distribute the rest okay. uh, to everybody else, because I, as usual, don't have a, a lot to say and rather listen. Um, uh, the, the little thing I wrote about, and it is really little compared to the uh, magnificent opuses that everybody else wrote, um, I, this whole Price Waterhouse thing has been interesting to me uh, uh, since the case was decided. and. I guess the, the essence of what I wrote about is this in, inevitable choice. I mean, it's very clear to anybody that Congress has no interest in protecting discrimination against the people on the basis of sexual orientation or transgender status. I mean, there's just no question about that. And the courts are all right when they say the statute doesn't apply to that in that sense that Congress clearly has taking the opportunity every time a bill has been proposed, which is, I think, almost every year since 1967, you know, not to amend the statute. So it's clear what Congress wants. At the same time, the Supreme Court has sort of said this thing about, you know, gender stereotyping. And so that there leaves it with the courts to figure out what they're going to do about it. And uh, they're in this bind. Uh, and, and I don't understand exactly what the big deal is, why, they're, why they have so much of a problem uh, generally refusing to recognize that that, the, that I think most of the reason why people have hostility towards persons of a different sexual orientation than theirs is because they think that's not the way people ought to act and that's not the way people ought to behave and that's not the way people ought to look and that's not the way people ought to dress and all of this sort of stuff. Uh, so it seems sort of obvious to me, I mean, you know, and the courts say, well, you know, when, whenever it gets to anything about the evidence, and that's sort of what I wrote in this little paper, it's easy to, to get past, you know, pleadings motions, but when it comes to the, to the real nuts of it in a uh, judgment as a matter of law motion, almost always, and particularly in the last uh, eight or nine years, the, the plaintiffs always lose, and the courts say, yeah, it's not about gender stereotyping. If it was, that'd be a different story. It's all about sexual orientation or being of transgendered status, uh, and I just haven't understood exactly why they don't take that next step. Almost none of them take the next step. A few have. Uh, in at least recognizing that at least a part of it, right? And of course, Waterhouse, it just has to be a part of it, is about stereotyping. Anyway, that's my thing. Thank you. Did I make my seven minutes? Yes, yeah. no, you're, you're, uh, you, you, have, you have set down a, a, a marker that's a model for all of us okay. to follow. <laughs> and by the way, Catherine, Catherine encouraged me to come because she promised me Coach K was going to be here to sign my... Uh, a little uh, agenda, so I'm, you just suddenly let me know when he comes in the door. It's a long day. You got he, he has spoken in this room before. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is he won't be here I today. I think that's what she meant to say. Uh, okay. uh, that will be hard to beat, but, but in the interesting, funny stuff that you say, y'all, and the timing, so I will try. And I will try, I will try to beat that by start singing. Uh, with a song, I guess. Uh, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking of a song, uh, the oldest songs by Sam Cooke, Wonderful World, uh, Don't Know Much, because I don't know much about history, I don't know much about biology, and I don't know much about identity. Uh, <laughs> what I know a little bit about is about labor economics, and I'm going to talk to you, uh, to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, which is not as interesting as uh, the other stuff. Uh, but it's my contribution to, uh, to, to the symposium, I hope. Uh, and it comes from <clears throat> the fact that uh, uh, labor economists, when talking about the decision by employees to work and the decision by employers to em employ employees, uh, they haven't really at all uh, for many years uh, dealt with the issue of identity. It hasn't just come in, uh, at all into their, uh, their scholarship. And the reason is because uh, <clears throat> when they model uh, uh, utilities, you know, the person's preference and the person's utility, uh, they take the utility as given. You know? Basically, it's, uh, as, uh, utilities are uh, exogenously determined. 
No, they are taken as, as given, and economists haven't really sort of explored the issue of what goes into an individual's utility. Um, and that's what identity doesn't play a role at all, no? So it's not an interest to them. In a series of paper, and that's what I uh, talk about in my uh, later contribution to the symposium, in a series of paper, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner George Akerlof and uh, 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 Rachel Cranton argue that identity is not a given, but is endogenously determined. That means that you can model a sort of identity, and identity is part of an individual's utility. In fact, uh, Akerlof and Cranton referred to identity as perhaps the most important economic decision that people make. Um, and they try to incorporate that into the individual's utility function. Their argument is, and I'm quoting from, from their paper, is that a person's identity describes gains and losses in utility from behavior that conforms or departs from norms for particular social categories in particular situations. What that means, I think, is that any limits that are imposed on an individual's identity, and we are talking here about the workplace, are limits that affect that individual utility. I think this framework is helpful, at least helpful to me in thinking about identity, because when you frame it that way, identity then becomes an economic transaction. Uh, and it's another incentive that employers and employees, in a sense, can transact over. Uh, second, I think that this framework also provides a helpful way of thinking about some of the difficult questions that, as Joel identified and other uh, in this uh, symposium, are raised with regard to the issue of uh, identity. Uh, for example, Professor, Professor Selmy, in his, in his uh, very interesting paper, uh, raises the issue of what distinguishes makeup from uh, uh, uniform. Now, if the employer cannot prohibit makeup, what then could the employer prohibit uniform? And I think what Akerlof and Cranton framework suggest is that there is no difference, no? Both makeups and dress codes relate to identity, and they limit, affect the, the, the employee's utility. If an employer wants to, to, the employee to give up some of her utility because of some employer's business objective, the employer should bargain with the employee about that. The point is that identity is one more element uh, of the exchange between employers and employees, and that it is not at all clear that employers should have a default ownership over identity. That is, is, a, is a, a incentive, a proper a, a, an incentive that should be uh, bargained over. Uh, so that's it, and I think that's a good transition towards Michael paper. Well, thank you. And I'm not sure I want to use any of my time for thank yous, but um, I'll just say quickly that, you know, if uh, Catherine and Me Too called me and said, will you come and talk about the rule against perpetuities, you know, I would come. <laughs> and I think we all would. <clears throat> uh, uh, we would probably talk about something else, but we would still come uh, uh, in doing that. So thank you for inviting That's me. That's what I funded is a, that conference. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll put in our receipts for that conference <laughs> then. Uh, and in preparing for this, um, my talk I had two thoughts I thought I would share. The first, when I was looking over my paper, trying to uh, figure out whether I could distill what I had to say into five to seven minutes, I'll tell you, it was a little dispiriting to realize I could. <laughs> that I really it took didn't. me one minute. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't have all that much more uh, to say. And then the other thing, when I was reading my paper on the plane coming down, I was reading and I was thinking, oh, this is pretty good. But I don't remember writing some of this. <laughs> Uh, the student editors had done a terrific job <laughs> with the editing, which is not usually my reaction to most of the editing I get, although it is the reaction that I had um, to, uh, I did a paper here last year with the same journal, and they did a terrific job. And one thing I've been convinced in my trips down here is that uh, Duke has some terrific students here, and I've been fortunate to work with them. Um, and thank you <laughs> for your work. Um, so I want to just make a couple of um, points, and I'm going to go from the less provocative to the most provocative, I think, in terms of trying to lay out um, how I see this. You know, the Jesperson case is just a wonderful case in so many respects. And um, I, as Raphael mentioned in the paper, I talk about how, it's, to me, it's very difficult to distinguish between makeup and a uniform. And there's no question that employers can require uniforms. And uh, then the question is, well, can they require makeup? And I think the distinction that people has, have made with respect to makeup is, well, there's this whole history of makeup and what it has done to women and the demeaning aspects of makeup. And that's certainly what uh, Darlene Jesperson reacted to. 
Uh, and there was a very interesting brief filed, and also the Lambda brief talked about the history of makeup and how it uh, objectifies women and the like. And, and that all seems true to me, but it also seems so unlikely that a court would uh, step up to intervene in that, since as a society we haven't embraced the uh, prohibitions on makeup, or we haven't accepted that makeup is uh, in fact, demeaning to women. In, in fact, it's just the opposite. Um, we, as a society, do uh, uh, not relish makeup. I'm not sure what the right term exactly is, and I, um, but it's uh, we clearly there's not a social norm against makeup, and I think it's asking far too much of the courts to expect that they would be the ones to uh, make that change, and that would be a change that would have to come from society. But then I also thought, well, Judge Schroeder, who wrote the decision, well, what if, and she, who's a woman, what if? Um, somebody made her wear makeup, would she be willing to do that? And the answer is, of course not. Uh, she would never allow anyone to tell her uh, to wear makeup. And then I thought, was thinking, you know, and when Justice uh, O'Connor wore those ruffles and stuff, I mean, she chose to do that, but if somebody forced her to do that, she would have certainly objected. Or if they had to wear different robes, if the women wore black robes and the men wore blue robes or something like that, uh, they would certainly object, but they wouldn't object because of their identity and like they would object because they can, because they have the power, because of their status. Uh, it's not because um, of necessarily it changes um, who they are. And in fact, it's one of the things that's uh, ironic in all this is the only group that really wears costumes in this um, uh, sort of a high level echelon are judges. You know, judges put on this costume and judges put on the costume in order to convey authority. And uh, in many ways, one of the things I talk about in the paper, we all do. You know, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, we dress for others for the most part. Uh, uh, we don't dress for ourselves, and we all dress to convey some image. And I think at work, too, we perform. You know, we go to work, and we're somebody else. And one of the problems, I think, with the Jesperson case and all these demands we're making about the workplace is we're expecting, demanding too much of the workplace. Uh, and by demanding too much, we actually then end up asking too little. Because when the workplace becomes the place where we gain our authenticity, where we get our identity, where the workplace is where we get our friends, our spouses, some other people's spouses, and the like. Uh, <laughs> when that happens, uh, the workplace becomes so important that we become afraid to make demands about wages, about hours, about all the things that the work was supposed to be about. Uh, and one of the things I think we need to do is de-escalate the importance of uh, work, downsize work instead of downsizing the employees, and, and let our authentic selves flourish elsewhere. Um, by asking too much of the workplace, I think ultimately we will find too little there. And that brings me to the last point I want to make. This is my more provocative, because one of the things that's always been interesting to me in terms of this case is whether Darlene Jesperson was gay, which is sort of an undertone to the case. And I ask that because on the website, uh, Lambda's website, they post three pictures of her. Uh, and there are three pictures, two of, whom, two of which are in her uniform, and that one is not. And those pictures can, uh, when you look at them, and some of you have, and presumably people have looked at them, I think they're still up. I don't have the ability to do it. You know, you could, um, in some of them, she looks like a stereotypically gay woman, middle-aged woman. And I wonder why Lambda, and Lambda's here, I think Jenny Pfizer's here, you know, why they posted it. Now, one of it is be, there's a before and after picture with the makeup. But you know, you really can't tell so much in the makeup that she, when she has the makeup on. There's two pictures of her in her uniform, and she looks like a bartender. Uh, and, uh, she, she, and the other thing that's ironic about the case, she wore a very manly outfit. She wore a tuxedo. And then they wanted also to, her to put all this makeup on uh, in addition to it. But she didn't object about the, the um, tuxedo. She objected only on the makeup. So you look at those pictures, and. I wonder, hmm, are they putting that up as f to convey a stereotype, to convey an image? Because there has been some question that, uh, as to, and there was also an article in the Dallas newspaper about the case, which just, the headline is, Lesbian Loses. And there's nothing in the case to suggest that she's a lesbian. And also in the Sanchez, or the, um, uh, the Azteca case, uh, in the Ninth Circuit case, which there's nothing in the case to suggest the guy is gay. In the uh, more recent Rene versus MGM case, Judge Pregerson says he's gay. And that, and so we're playing on some stereotypes. And there's a third picture of uh, Darlene Jesperson on that website, and that's one where she's out of her uniform, and she's sitting on a rock. She's sitting uh, uh, somewhere. She looks much more peaceful. She doesn't look like a bartender. She looks like a person, like a, the person that I think she is, the person who objected to the makeup. And I think one of the things you see in the picture are clear, distinct selves: the work self and the off-work self. 
And I think focusing on and the, keeping that distinction will actually address the question because I think the people's response, and I can sort of see it when I ask, is she gay? So, well, you shouldn't be asking that. Uh, and maybe that's right. But maybe that also suggests we should keep the work and the private self separate. Maybe we shouldn't look for our identity in the workplace and instead look for our identity and our authenticity outside of the workplace. Uh, well, I, I'm here essentially, I think, to, to address these issues from a practitioner's standpoint, uh, from the practical. I think that uh, this is an emerging area of the law. Um, people have approached it in very different, very interesting ways, and the articles that I've read so far from this symposium are fascinating. Uh, but what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is really how this applies practically and how employers are addressing these issues, what are the difficulties that they're facing. Uh, and what advice can, what can I give them as, as their legal counsel as they try to work through these issues, knowing that the courts are approaching this in different ways in different circuits. Uh, it is very difficult for a national employer to try to have a standard policy or practice when, they, when the, these issues are approached very differently in different circuits. So how do you, how do you address that? How do you work through these issues um, as an employer, both with respect to dress codes and also with the other issues relating to sex stereotyping that arise every day in the workplace? Uh, first, with respect to dress and appearance codes, uh, employers have a legitimate business interest in presenting a particular business image. Society recognized that, the courts have recognized that, and appearance and dress codes play into that. Uh, I think it becomes, to, as courts have recognized, a question of reasonableness. Uh, it is effective, it is branding, whether we, whether we like it or not, it works. Uh, UPS, everyone recognizes the brown uniform. Uh, if anyone has ever been to Disney World, everyone knows how important uh, appearance and branding is to their image and to what they have created. So it comes down to a question of what, what can employers do? Where are those lines? And I'm not here to, to, to necessarily defend one policy or another or to say these are where the lines should be drawn, but just to address what I've seen and how people are trying to deal with these issues. Um, as I say, I think it's difficult on a national perspective because of the different jurisdictions that employers are working in, both because there are different laws. Obviously, some jurisdictions protect sexual orientation discrimination, some don't. Uh, to know what your legal risks are are very different in different jurisdictions. In Washington, D.C., we actually have appearance as a protected category in the D.C. Human Rights Statute. You cannot discriminate on the basis of appearance. Um, it is. So knowing what the law is, where you, are, where you are operating, can be very difficult and tricky, I think, for, for employers on a national scale. Also, the law in this area talks about sex stereotyping versus sort of accepted community standards. That is also a difficult issue to deal with when you are in many different communities where the standards are very different. An approach to an issue in a plant for one of my employers uh, in the in southern Kentucky is going to be, to be uh, going to be approached very differently than people may react to the same issue in New York City, and how do you deal with that when you are are trying to address these issues on a global level? Um, but many of the people that many of the employers that I work with have addressed it by trying to have a more generalized, flexible policy, uh, professional appearance and dress, and sort of limited explanations of examples of what that may be um, as a way to try to avoid the avoid the situation where there is a specific, for instance, makeup requirement or hair requirement that could then be challenged. That then leaves you, though, with a sort of subjective what is acceptable and what isn't. Just as I know it when I see it doesn't really work in the pornography arena, it doesn't really work as well so much in, a, in, the, in this area as well. It results in subjective decision making that then opens you up to a whole other area of risk. It also doesn't work if you are really trying to brand a particular image. Um, Many of these companies are looking for a very specific look. So what do you do? Uh, I think that you try to create a policy that is objective to the extent possible, that is the same for both women, men and women to the extent possible. Uh, we've talked a little bit about unequal burdens, and I agree with, with many of the people who have said in their papers or elsewhere that that is the less interesting, um, perhaps, issue in the Jesperson case as opposed to the sex stereotyping issues. But it is something for an employer to, to focus on. It is obviously something the courts um, uh, look to. And so it's something that every employer needs to be aware of. And you need to tie it to a business reason, uh, whatever your standards may be. 
And so employers are working on this and looking through these issues and trying to deal with them. And I think that as the law evolves and as understanding and acceptance of, of differences evolve, we'll see, the, we'll see the policies that employers are implementing evolve as well, I can only hope. I think beyond the, beyond the issue of dress codes, sex stereotyping comes up every day in, in many different ways. I see it working with my clients, also just as a woman attorney in a big law firm. It comes from everything from the, the assumption that a woman's not going to want to go on the golf trip uh, to, with the others, that they're not going to want to play in the poker game. Uh, it comes up, certainly, uh, one of the issues I had for a client recently was with respect to uh, bathroom access for a transgendered individual, preoperative male um, transitioning to female. And the question came up in this plant in rural Tennessee, I believe it was, where, does, where is this individual going to use, which bathroom are they going to use? Uh, the company offered uh, him or her the, a unisex bathroom, a, an individual bathroom, thought that was unacceptable because it was substandard. The, em the employees were up in arms. There were petitions signed by management and non-management. They didn't want him or her using either bathroom. Uh, people were, took it very, very seriously, very deeply. It was extremely, um, extremely disruptive to their workplace. And these sorts of issues are coming up surprisingly often. Employers are having to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're not easy answers. Um, so those are just sort of some of the, the things that I see from the practical perspective, looking at these issues, dealing with, with employers every day. And I hope that as the law evolves and as our understanding evolves, that also approaches to this will evolve in the same way. Thank you. It's a very disciplined group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to follow suit with the discipline. Um, so I just want to spend a few minutes discussing, first, what I find so puzzling about the case law in this area. Um, second, what I think is actually driving the current case law. And, and finally, what I, what I think is potentially troubling and problematic in the case law. So as a general matter, with some exceptions that I'll touch on, courts treat discrimination against butch women and effeminate men as actionable sex discrimination, while treating discrimination against those who violate sex-specific grooming and, and um, clothing requirements as not actionable discrimination. Now, as an initial, initial matter, um, I find the current sex discrimination jurisprudence puzzling because I don't think it can be explained by any coherent or consistent non-discrimination principle. And in particular, I don't believe that the current case law can be explained by a principled commitment to either sex-blind neutrality or anti-subordination. Um, and in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to expand on those arguments, but instead I'm going to move on and, and talk about what I think is actually driving the case law in this area. So it seems to me that courts are distinguishing between different types of gender nonconforming behavior based on their sense of how important and integral the behavior is to an individual's gender identity. So as a result, mannerisms and behaviors are given more protection than clothing and hair choices, particularly when the latter are deemed idiosyncratic expressions of personal preference rather than concerted efforts to express a core gender identity. So the former are deemed more integral to gender identity and more a part of one's core self than the latter. So in Jesperson versus Harris Operating Company, the en banc Ninth Circuit minimized the plaintiff's interest in not wearing makeup and emphasized the sex-specific grooming requirements did not become illegal simply because they were personally offensive to the plaintiff. So not surprisingly then, the first two cases in which courts have provided anti-discrimination protection to male cross-dressers have involved pre-operative transsexuals who claimed that the cross-dressing was integral to their expression of authentic gender identity rather than an expression of idiosyncratic personal preference. Now, my concern with the current case law stems from what I see as a new kind of gender essentialism. So by treating some forms of conduct and appearance as integral to gender identity and hence worthy of anti-discrimination protection, while treating other forms of conduct as matters of mere personal preference and hence unworthy of such protection. Courts are in effect defining and reifying what constitutes gender. They're then defining the scope of Title VII's protection from sex discrimination so as to encompass discrimination not only based on sex but based on gender as well. Now I find this gender essentialism, this new gender essentialism, troubling for three reasons. So first, the new gender essentialism seems to treat some forms of gender expression as innate or unavoidable, while other forms of expression are treated as freely chosen. 
I'm not sure that this distinction really maps onto how people experience or express their gender. And I'm uncomfortable with the hierarchical position in which courts place the two types of expression. So I don't believe that gender expressions must somehow be innate or unavoidable, rather than the expression of choice and agency to be integral to the person and worthy of legal protection. And a second, the new gender essentialism continues to define and confine acceptable and protected forms of gender expression, even if these expressions are no longer limited to or defined by biological sex. So the scope of anti-discrimination laws protection is defined, in other words, by those traits and attributes that women and men have historically been permitted to have. More diverse and idiosyncratic gender expressions are likely to be excluded. I'm not convinced that such limits are either justified or required by Title VII's non-discrimination mandate. Now finally, what I find most problematic is that I believe that this new gender essentialism will actually make it less likely that we will see a similar kind of expansion and protection for racially associated traits and attributes. So while courts have been expanding the range of conduct entitled to protection in the sex context, including a range of forms of gender identity performance, courts have been very narrow and cabined in their conception of what constitutes race discrimination generally limiting race discrimination to traditional forms of status discrimination and excluding forms of racial identity performance. Now, to the extent that courts are expanding the scope of sex discrimination protection by treating certain traits and attributes as inherently part of one's gender and hence protected, they're grounding protection on arguments that I believe are simply untenable legally and politically in the race context. So racial equality and non-discrimination in this country is strongly linked to ideas of racial blindness and racial transcendence. Claims about racial difference and even racial significance smack dangerously of our country's white supremacist past. So as a result, I don't believe that courts will ever expand protection for traits and attributes associated with race if doing so either requires or suggests acceptance of any similar type of racially associated essentialism. So to the extent, then, that expanded anti-discrimination protection in the sex context is linked to a new form of gender essentialism rather than to more traditional forms of anti-subordination arguments, the case law seems to me to hold little persuasive power or possibility in the race context and is likely to lead to increasingly divergent levels of protection in the two areas. Can we start there? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we'll, uh, I, I, what I want to do is put a, a few um, sort of standard law professor hypos on the table and see how people on, in the panel and in the audience would respond to them. But just because I'm afraid I'll lose this point if I don't ask it now. So um, um, I'm not, and I'm not sure I fully understand it, but if, if um, you're concerned that there's not going to be the same kind of protection for race as for, for, for gender, but since you have problems in the gender area that it has been, it has uh, had the effect of creating a kind of troublesome gender essentialism um, if, if it were to be also expanded to include race, wouldn't it have the same problems? I mean, yeah. um, my problem is not so much with the expansiveness, though I don't agree with all forms of expansive, the, all the forms that the expansiveness have taken in the sex context. My concern is more with what I see to be to the extent the courts are justifying their decisions at all, the way in which the justifications seem to be coming forth. So I'd feel much more comfortable in the sex context as well in the race context, as context in expanding um, or sort of defining forms of protected, what I've called sort of trait discrimination, based more strongly on sort of subordination concerns. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, would get at the, the range of, of areas that I think should be protected in the sex context while also allowing for um, expansion that I think would be useful in the race context as well. So m my concern with the sex context is, is really about the incoherence in the court's sort of current explanations, um, and, I, and I think the sort of undercurrent in their explanations, which I see as this kind of um, essentialism. But I don't think that's necessary for them to be able to, to justify or explain the decisions. But one of the things I'd like to eventually get to, or if, I, if we don't hear today, perhaps in some subsequent panel, is whether or not it would be possible to be coherent in this, in this area. I, I think that's a real live yeah. question. But yeah. let, let's start at a, an earlier point in the set of problems um, and just go through um, a, f a few of the standard hypotheticals that have come up in the papers uh, um, 
and, and see where there's agreement and where there's disagreement and, and where there's uh, opportunity to, um, to, to delve deeper into this. So I take it, um, I, I uh, recently uh, visited the Oakley um, plant out in uh, Southern California. Um, that, that, for those of you who don't know, they make, you probably know Oakley sunglasses, but they also make all kinds of action sports gear and snowboards and all, all kinds of stuff like this. They require all of their employ employees, doesn't matter what they wear, um, but, the, but it has to be Oakley brand. Um, I take it nobody would object to that. Good, corp <laughs> good corporate branding. Anybody on the panel first? You get first shot at it, and I'm going to go to the audience. Yeah. No, I was just saying I would object to that. I don't think employers buy anything but your labor, and even then that's problematic given the way they, you know, expropriate the excess value. But leaving that aside, I, I just don't think... I don't know why I, I'm bothered by the fact that we have to find rights for all these people, and I, why are the employers buying your anything else but your labor in the first place for the dollar for the mm -hmm. dollars that are throwing in your direction? Well, I guess put the other way is why when they pay you your wage aren't they paying for the work you do and whatever part of your identity you may need to give up in order to buy into the corporate branding program. Well, you can, you can frame it the other way. Why, why did they, when they pay you your wage, they are only paying you for the work you do, nothing else. Like if they want to pay you for, if they want something else, they have to buy that. This seems sort of well, like a contract issue. You know, what, what, what are they? Well, uh, if identity is a negotiable incentive, no? Right. Then they have to pay for that. If they bought your labor already, if they want something else, I think, which is the point, they have to purchase that as well, mm -hmm. as they purchase other things in the incentive scheme when they negotiate with employees. Well, Raphael, I mean, what if the employer, uh, imagine you're a salesperson for uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. Huh? <laughs> that, that will, I can tell you in my case, that will never happen. I can never happen. <laughs> Think of another example. <laughs> Brothers. You mean that's like that's like me starring in a Mel Gibson movie? Huh? <laughs> um, um, well, and they say you know um, be nice to the customers, be nice, treat them respectfully. My father worked his whole lifetime at Macy's, as did his father, and they always told me the customer's always right. That's what they were told, and 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 it's hard for. And so when you say well you know you're paid. What are you paid for? Okay, so isn't part of it you're paid to be nice? And, and my sense is, though I, I've, I've, I've never had a real job, I've only been a teacher, um, um, uh, that when you work in one of these clothing stores, The Gap, if that's more suitable, uh, I, my sense is they probably either uh, encourage you or maybe require you to wear their clothing because you are... Uh, you are selling their clothing. It's like, the, you know, when I was a kid and the guys walked up and down the street, you know, eat at Joe's with these billboards on them. I mean, if you have to be nice because that helps sell the product, I doubt anybody would have a problem with that. So what's the difference if you have to wear the Gap clothing? And let's assume everybody has to wear exactly the bla same black Gap shirt. I mean, from what I sense is, well, you're, you know, you're a billboard and, 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 and that... That very light reading I had last night by by uh, Mary and Diane that I that I read. <laughs> um, Great paper. Uh, Great you know, paper. talks a lot about. But I but I, I just I mean it's exactly the point you made. I don't, I'm not I don't know I don't know anything about economics or history or geometry. But <laughs> but it seems to me that that there's a certain certain things that are just part of what is bought, and that includes being nice to the customers and promoting your brand. Can I throw in just two, because mm -hmm. there are, it, um, it just feels like I should say something. There's, uh, these are all real cases too, right? The people, and one problem with the gap in the Abercrombie and Fitch is they make people pay the, for the clothes, which they shouldn't do, and they can't do if it makes it go below a certain wage or a minimum wage or if it um, violates some state statute. So these are, you know, there are restrictions of what they can do, but it also seems, what Jill's talking about, I mean, your parent, you don't go to work and do whatever you want. Nobody does. And you can't go to work without clothes, right? <laughs> You've got to do wear something, and well, if you have to, <laughs> I, 
I assume we would agree that that's, and if you have to wear clothes, they should be able to, and then the question is, well, what's the next step? But, uh, a cu couple and, of comments, and then I want to uh, move on. Um, let's see, I had, somebody's, okay, yeah, you. Um, well, part of your justification for that argument you were making was you have to wear clothes, but couldn't you make the case that makeup is fundamentally different from clothes because you may not have to wear makeup, there's no problem. We're just on clothes for the moment. Oh, okay. stick, stick to clothes just for this, yeah. Response in the in the back. Oh yeah, um, I thought you said yeah, I thought you were talking about a factor. Um, this is actually a uh, all of the management offices and the factory are in one big bunker. Yeah, okay. yeah. But there's not a lot of customers coming in. There, no, there are customers. They have a retail. Yeah, they have a retail at the okay, ground level. So that was part of my reaction. Was Music was too loud. I couldn't stay there, but. <laughs> But it, and it does well, come up in the I'm sorry, it does come up yeah. in the fact in the factory context as well. I had a client yeah. who they had they all of their employees had to wear uniforms and they <coughs> um, decided they wanted them to pay a dollar for their uniforms. They thought that it, it sort of would engender more loyalty to the company and would also make them maybe treat the uniforms a little better if they were invested in it and it was a dollar. Uh, and they, the employees were up in arms, were absolutely yeah. incensed by the idea of having to do that. But yeah, par part of the idea is the customer, I mean, I think the two things here are probably more, but there's, there's the whole relationship with a customer, and then there's the, what you write about, the, 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 um, the whole corporate culture that you're cr trying to create in terms of people's identification yeah, that's with. The part I've yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> One more comment, we're going to move on. Just, just a clarifying question, actually. Is the question whether the Oakley requirement is objectionable, all things considered, or whether it's objectionable as a matter of discrimination? I mean, so I whether or not, an on whatever theory we could spin out, whether, whether the law ought to prohibit the company from that requirement. So I think we're all, I mean, all these things we're talking about, there may be, it may be sensible or not sensible for an employer to require that, but should they be? Should the, should the law prohibit them from requiring that is the question. Let me just say before we move on that now the mics are on at your seat. And so they weren't while we were just talking, but now that we're having uh, give and take. And you, you need to be careful not to hit your mic or put your papers on it or whatever because it, it um, makes very irritating noise. <laughs> um, Catherine? So you have to wear clothes to work, but Abercrombie and Fitch's advertising campaign last summer was actually almost totally naked men. <laughs> right? you, have to wear, you have to wear underwear to work. Uh, yeah, I mean, but that's about all they and jeans about as low as they could possibly go. So it's also the question of you have to wear clothes, but if Abercrombie and Fitch decides they want to sell clothes by having very buff men not wear clothes, can they do that? If, that's, if their brand is, we're selling jeans by selling actually nakedness. Let, let me move down to the, um, <laughs> the, the next, because this is related. This, this will just, uh, so the tattoo parlor who wants everybody who works, who insists that everybody who works in the tattoo parlor have a visible tattoo. Where are we on that, Joel? Related to what you, uh, since you've yeah, uh, felt. I'm not an expert on tattoos, <laughs> um, but I assume you're talking about the ones, you know, where they hurt you when they, yeah. as opposed <laughs> to what my kids do when they paint themselves. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me there's a health issue there. The, first, for me, I mean, you know, that's like telling people who uh, work for, uh, well, I shouldn't say this in North Carolina, but work for a cigarette manufacturer, you know, you have to smoke the product. Uh, uh, because that, you know, uh, to me, uh, <laughs> There's just a health issue here I can't get past. So I, I can't fall into that. Yeah, of course, there are a lot of, um, uh, uh, there, uh, uh, a, a lot of things that, part of some traditional dress codes that have health implications, uh, probably high heel shoes being one of the more um, uh, prominent ones. But may maybe we should get beyond the health, you know, sort of beyond the health issues, are there, there, there is a permanence issue. Uh, yeah. I would argue that the uh, tattoo parlor issue presents a, an entirely different issue because tattoo parlors are, uh, in a sense, an identity choice to begin with. I've never been in a tattoo parlor where people didn't have visible tattoos, usually covering massive portions of their body. Um, but you obviously have been in tattoo parlors. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I have. <laughs> so um, it, it, it strikes me as an interesting uh, 
intersection of the idea of identity and the workplace in that I don't think you would work in the tattoo parlor without already having several visible tattoos. And then so, what does yeah, that what do we, say? I mean, because presumably the people who work for Oakley <coughs> think that Oakley is pretty cool, too. I mean, I, that doesn't really get to the issue, does it, of whether or not they should be required. You know, maybe it's the best receptionist job somebody could get or um, any. Well, I mean, if you're working in a factory, I see working in a factory as uh, very different from working in a tattoo mm -hmm. parlor. Okay. I Hi, I'm Emily Ho from Cincinnati. Um, and Good idea. If we could say our names <laughs> from the that would be real helpful. I mean, part of this is, and I'm going to, not to denigrate the term out, but I'm going to out myself as a tattooed person. I've been in a lot of tattoo parlors, and I, I've had extensive <laughs> tattooing work. <laughs> and the thing about it is, and this also kind of gets to Michael's point about, I wanted to say something too about Michael's point about the photos on the website at Lambda. Because for me, as a customer, um, I go into a tattoo parlor, and if I see someone there who's not tattooed or who has poor work done, even though I probably know they haven't done the work on themselves, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to that place to get the tattoo. And you know, I don't know if you can call this customer preference. I'm, I'm not really sure. But t the way that I kind of wanted to relate it to what you were saying about the heavy makeup and the sort of tuxedo is I whispered to Mario as you we were saying that, well, that's just sort of in service to sort of this straight male fantasy, sex fantasy. And you know, we are talking about Vegas, so it's all about sex, right? I mean, and, well, <laughs> for some people. Um, so you know, I'm wondering why this isn't kind of approached from a sort of customer preference angle, because we know from the, the Southwest, the, the, love, air, the love airline case, right, that that's not, you know, you can't require something based on customer preference. Um, and so to me, you know, a lot of this issue of sort of how you're dressed or not dressed, or how you're tattooed or not tattooed, or made up or not made up, uh, relates to sort of customer preference and whether that can, you know, what, where that is in this sort of conversation. Of course, it's not clear that all customer preference has the same legal significance. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the Love Airline, customer preference is, is a stereotype that's being reinforced and profits are being made on it and, and, and it has some negative. Right, the the first customer preference you were talking about is kind of a, well, a credibility the of the product. Right. The, the thing about Harrods, though, where the, the cas you know, when you're in the casino and you're being served by scantily clad women, I mean, we were just in Las Vegas two weeks ago, and, um, you know, you're, I mean, so much of the sort of culture there is about <coughs> drinks and the sex and the sort of um, constant feeding of that. Um, you know, I, I, just as something to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to out myself Name. as someone. Oh, Gallery Ramachandran, uh, and I teach at Southwestern Law School. I'm going to out myself as someone who's been to Harrah's Casino, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not the one in Reno. Um, and that casino is interestingly, I would sort of say, if I were to interpret it, not about sex at all. The people. Uh, the cocktail waitresses and the bartenders are not wearing scanty uniforms. Um, that casino is about gambling and being friendly and that sort of thing. But I did find uh, all the female beverage servers there to be made up like Tammy Faye Baker. <laughs> <laughs> weird. It was this he a really weird conflict between the way everyone was made up and the actually really sort of professional, incredibly mainstream, not sexy uniforms that they were wearing. And I think you're right that it is about, I really felt like it was about Harris Casino trying to toe the line between being a family friendly establishment or the kind of establishment that um, you know people would not mind going to with their spouse and uh, playing into a male sex fantasy. And so they were really trying to have it both ways. And I think when we think about customer preference, we should try to distinguish between uh, preference and what people are actually paying for and what is the product really being sold. Yeah, it's hard to know there whether you wanted to find the issue is whether the whether Harris had a right to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, they might they you know if I if, if uh, I think it was in Diana and Marion's paper they you know there was this they they were trying to make everybody uniform that was the point and the critical mass of of Bartender, do I have this right? The critical mass of bartenders were fairly made up, and so they had to, rather than have them make up down, they had to make her make up up. 
so that, it, in other words, it leaves the question whether um, they, they had a right to, to, to do that, even though it might not have made sense as a, as a business proposition. A couple more points, and then I want to put a few others on the table. One, two. This sort of goes to the idea of both permanent Name. and oh, Rita Trevetti. Um, this goes to the question of permanence is also um, separate identities, you know, your workplace identity versus your private identity, for lack of a better word. That, you know, in the tattoo example, you can be a tattoo artist and have your tattoo. You can't exactly take it off when you leave your workplace. But I think, you know, with issues such as uniforms or even makeup to some extent, that you can consider just as we wear certain clothes to a law firm to go and practice that I might think are absolutely uncomfortable and I would never want to wear something like that. That's part of my identity as a lawyer. Whereas I might have a different set of wardrobe for an identity as a mother and a separate, you know, set of wardrobe for identity when I'm going out with my husband to dinner. That in those different roles, as we adapt them, why can we not put that into practice in the workplace. Our identities are in part the fact that I'm an employee at Abercrombie and Fitch or you know I'm an employee at Harris. Why is that not, you know, considered as part of your identity as your workplace choice? Uh, Justin Wilson, I'm an executive editor of the Gender um, Journal. Um, my I think to tag off of what Reed is saying, our our challenge here is really about how can we navigate the line between creating the utility that one gets from being dressed as a lawyer or being dressed as an Abercrombie and Fitch employee, but without, with, where's the line between that and minstrelizing somebody? And I think, I, think I, I sense from the comments that are, that are coming out that, that we're not really uncomfortable with the idea of asking somebody to wear something to work. It's when does that cross the line into some sort of reverse covering problem where people are being made up like Timmy K. Baker. And I think, I think, um, uh, I, I, all right, I'm just going to stop there, sorry. Yeah, I, and I <laughs> shouldn't have called, I, thank you for that point, but I realize I went out of order. Yeah, I, I'm Ann McGinley from um, UNLV, and I've spent a lot of time in the casinos. <laughs> 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 um, I do not think that Harris, and I think we're going to have the Harris Associate <coughs> General Counsel speak, I do not think they think that putting makeup on women is making them sex stereotypes. Now, <coughs> I, when you get out there, it is totally shocking how people just assume that that's the way women are supposed to look. And it has, I don't think that, because the women in the bartender outfits are not sexy, but generally in most of the casinos, the women in the cocktail waitress outfits are incredibly sexy. They're sexing them up, there's no question. But they also talk about them as being classy and traditional. Mm. And I think that whole, that whole mindset is one that hasn't really, you know, sort of, unless you live there or spend a lot of time there, you, you don't quite get. So, I mean, it's really a very interesting concept. And I don't, um, I'm not sure whether Mary Schroeder really got it either. But I'm, I'll be talking about it later. But I just wonder. Good, good. Yeah. Let's, let's just flip this uh, tattoo business around and assume a, um, uh, a natural food store. I think, uh, Mike, this may have been in your paper, and maybe not the natural food store, but the, 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 the rule anyway, whatever the setting, where employees need to be unadorned. <coughs> they, they, they can't have perfumes and makeup and leather, whatever, whatever, whatever your, uh, the, the code is of the employers of this natural uh, food store doesn't, doesn't want to be, you know, wants an image of a countercultural, environmentally sound, um, no animal testing products and that sort of thing. Uh, what about that rule? Uh, I'm Michael Yelnowski from Roger Williams. I'm going to make a simple point. Those are the, those are the kind I tend to make. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think for me, in, in, in a lot of these hypotheticals that don't pose a discrimination issue, um, you know, the only uh, and, and, and this is sort of previewing this afternoon's um, uh, panel uh, with, with uh, Diane and Marion. You know, to me, the only body of law that gives you real traction in this area is, is labor law. The discrimination law does nothing for you. The common law does virtually nothing for you. Um, labor law at least presents the possibility 
that these bargaining disparities um, that lead to employees being in the position where they can't resist uh, what they view as unreasonable demands um, can be rectified in some way. And there are lots of reasons why um, labor law uh, can't be relied on as the as as the ultimate solution to these problems, but but for me that it needs to be part of the conversation mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. that, that that's be, that's yeah. the react that's my reaction to a, to so far all of these. Right, right. That's a very good point to make. Um, Can I do a quick follow up there? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the reason you can't is that uh, the lines in this conference are very difficult to draw, but there's one area I think we can keep from poaching on, which is the labor right. Stay, stay away this morning from, uh, from the sort of lab, the labor law solution to this because because uh, I don't want to consider uh, me silent. Okay. <laughs> well, you and Michael. I mean, do you want to say something that's nope. consistent with that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you the moderator. You want to tell me to be quiet too? Uh, like, the, the moderator <laughs> this afternoon will be sure to get these folks re, re involved in this part of the conversation. As part of that panel this afternoon, Mary and <laughs> Carolina, let me just argue with that a little bit. One of the problems for labor law is always being isolated and put off on the side. And, and, and so all of these issues get addressed as individual rights questions, which undermines the power of people like Darlene Jesperson to be able to make the case, because they get dismissed as idiosyncratic and subjective in their reaction, when in fact we found some evidence, we'll talk about this later, that other women were disturbed as well by this makeup requirement, but only Darlene filed the Title VII claim. So I guess I would not want any discussion of collective rights, whether we talk about collective bargaining and labor law specifically, but collective rights to be eliminated from the rest of the day until mm -hmm. five, 5 o'clock. Okay, well, I don't want to co-opt the afternoon panel, and, and I'm, I'm hoping this won't be seen as marginalization, but rather this is the that will be the climax. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about it, you can. Uh, but uh, I think I think there are a lot of issues here that we we might want to thresh out with this panel. That that um, uh, we'll we'll set that discussion up quite nicely. Uh, Lucille Ponte, University of Central Florida. I guess my thought on it is this issue of choice. That I think the court often overstates the fact that people have choice. That the people in the Oakley plant or in Abercrombie actually have the choice. It is very coercive. You either have the job or you don't have the job. And I think many people in this room have the option of many different jobs, but that's not true for a lot of people. So I think one thing to keep in mind is, regardless of whether you talk about collective bargaining, it is individual coercion. And to assume that if you just, well, make another choice, pick another job, I think that's, that's a very cavalier way for most people who are just trying to make ends meet in a lot of these cases. Martha Shamalas from Ohio State. Uh, as I was thinking about the, the, the very first uh, BFOQ cases against the airlines, like the Diaz case, and the audacity of a, the federal judge to declare that the court, rather than the business, would decide what the essence of the business was. <laughs> and I think, in, in so many ways, that's another way of saying mm -hmm. that you could sexualize the business um, and denying um, the default to be that the business owned the identity of the workers. I mean, that's kind of how I see the law and the, the economic discourse. And it was actually so much easier to say that, not because it was a gender discrimination case, I don't think. That was still real controversial right, back right. then. But because we didn't, have, we, we didn't have this notion that employers could uh, require employees to use their bodies and to use their personalities to advertise the brand. And you know, we've, we've all benefited so much from Mary and Diane's paper. Uh, and so I, I, I think that we can, even though these are little discrimination cases that maybe don't uh, always illuminate uh, some of the, the bigger issues, the, the track that the courts went down in terms of taking away the sort of definitional power from the business. Um, is something to explore. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also interesting which cases come forward as the sort of <coughs> the, the landmark cases. Yeah. Um, I'm reminded a little bit about, um, of all places, you know, the big Title IX case was against Brown University, which had been one of the, in the vanguard of, of improving uh, uh, opportunities for women in sports. It sounds like from, uh, from uh, what we learn in these papers that, that Harris was one of the least 
sort of sexualized um, workplaces, and now it's sort of become the standard bearer for this for this uh, for this conflict. I'm Sapna Kumar, I'm a fellow at Duke. Um, I wanted to go back to your hypothetical about the natural food store. Yeah, that's good. No one's addressed that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one's particularly interesting because the way I see it, it's not just about uh, a uniform dress code or promoting the brand, but it's also about not offending you know, the ethics or the, the positions that the customers hold. Um, you know, you imagine the people shopping there, there are a lot of vegetarians or vegans, and that seeing someone wearing leather would be deeply offensive to them and make them less likely to shop at the store, or it may even cause distress. So I kind of see a, an issue in terms of the company being able to do what it does being related to what the employees are wearing. Or if there's someone with a perfume sensitivity who knows they can shop. You talk about customer preference? Mm -hmm. it, it's, about, it's about preference, but it's also about the company being able to, to, um, to serve that niche, to be able to sell things to vegetarians, to be able to sell things to people sensitive to, to fragrances. Mm -hmm. All involves employees not you know, dressing that way. You know, just on the customer preference point, it's, um, we mentioned this a little bit, customer preference is not uh, illegal or a bad word. It is in some context. But the idea that somebody go to work at Abercrombie and Fitch wearing a Gap t-shirt just seems ridiculous. You would never allow that. And same thing, you wouldn't let somebody at a natural food store wear a shirt with a big steak on it, presumably. <laughs> and it's, as soon as you start doing that, it, you're then drawing difficult <laughs> lines. And there really is no way of coming up with a coherent line. And now I'm going to say what I wasn't supposed to say. And that is <laughs> <laughs> Michael's point. You know, the problem with the law is we're just expecting too much from Title VII. Workers need more power. You talk about choice. There's no question. But Title VII's not going to give them that power. We're looking to the wrong place. Um, and by doing, by looking to Title VII, we're distorting the law in this way that Kimberly talked about. You know, these sexual stereotype cases are fun, and they're completely incoherent. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, you can't make sense of them. And it's because there's nothing else. It's because labor law has fallen off. It's because the common law has fallen off. It's because we all look to Title VII, but we could look elsewhere. And we could try and get workers more power, but not through Title VII. Yeah, okay, if you've got workers' power on the agenda, I'm just going to say one thing because I'm not going to be here this afternoon. <laughs> but, you know, is it clear that, that, that collective action is going to protect the real outlier em employee? I mean, what um, Me Too, I'll pick this because it's so improbable, but the way he dresses anything is possible. Um, <laughs> me, me, too, me Too shows up for, um, f for his um, international finance course on Monday, and he's wearing a dress. OK. Um, I mean, so what do, I, what do I do with that, by the way? As his boss. Make sure <laughs> yes. Let him teach his Students. class. Well, because Students. he has tenure, there's not much you can do. <laughs> you know, that is the power. Students come in and they're very, you know, they're distracted. They can't, they can't learn their stuff. This is a law school. We're all about legal education. You tell them to get over it. <laughs> Make this an educational opportunity. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, pick up, if I might, on the comment that uh, uh, Michael makes about whether we in fact expect too much uh, from the law. I'm sorry, Devin Carbato, UCLA School of Law. Um, and I think that might be true, but on some level it might also prove too much in the following sense. I mean, if in fact we have a body of law that's designed to deal with racial discrimination, then for gender discrimination or whatever the relevant category is, it seems to me that we have to try to push that law to deal with what we understand to be the realities of race. Now, I'm not romantic about the extent to which law might actually be able to do that. Um, I also think that uh, law is changed as a function of what's going on on the ground as well. But um, we have a body of law that is supposed to deal with discrimination. Um, it's not as though there's an exit. The law is already telling us what race is, what gender is. And sometimes we talk about this issue as though it's the moment that we move 
into, say, questions of gender nonconformity, that the law is essentializing gender. That's a mistake. Or it's the moment that we try to move away from a static conception of race, that the law is essentializing race. That's a mistake. The law is in the business always of telling us the boundaries of what race is. So it's not a question of whether or not we want the law to be there. It's always going to be a question of precisely how. And I think you're perfectly right uh, to push us to think about whether going down this particular road might engender um, more harm than good. I think that's a productive question uh, for us to explore. And I'm mixed on it, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but I don't have too much difficulty with the idea that we can expect <coughs> more from Title VII so long as, in fact, we have this anti-discrimination regime. Uh, Mike, do you want to respond? And then I want to give the chance, uh, before I move on to the last uh, set of hypotheticals, for anybody else on the panel to respond to anything that's been said so far. I'm, not, I'm trying to, it's, um, I agree with most of that. Uh, and I think, you know, clearly the law helps set the boundaries, but it's not just the law, too. It, you know, it's, it's an interactive process with society, and I think. And I think when we expect the law to be better, or sort of our best aspect, you know, our best selves, I think that's asking too much. We're going to be disappointed uh, more often than not. Now, there are, I think you're right, we can use the law, um, but I think we need to use it more strategically. I think a lot of these cases are not... So, I mean, if we're trying to actually change norms, I don't think the way we're going to battle with these cases and the Selter Sculpture way is going to do it. There's, and there's no question that you know, the law does help shape those norms, but it goes in both directions. And I'm afraid that we've lost sight of that. And now, because you know, everyone sees labor laws dead and all, we just keep trying to do so much with Title VII. And I think that's the problem. But I, 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 it's, a, it's a nice framing, the way you put it. Other observations or points before we? If I may just say briefly, I mean, some of the hypotheticals have to go, go back to this issue of, 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 of unpacking the employment contract. And the, the point that I think I was uh, trying to make is that I think we have to be careful when we just talk about the, the employment contract and assume that there are some default rules that the employers own it. The employer might own it or might not. I don't know. And I mean, some of the hypotheticals are hard. I mean, does the... They be nice. I mean, I think is that something that is purchased when you pay the wage, the the the, the employee, the employee his or her salary. Uh, perhaps so because it's implied. You know, like we imply things in other contracts, in other transactions. Not every item in every transaction in every contract is specified, but there are some implied terms that are assumed. So the be nice perhaps is one of those that don't have to be spelled out because everybody assumes so. But I'm not sure about identity that we can say the same thing with that. You know, and that, that's all that I was suggesting, that some of these terms, I think, have to be unpacked before we make these generalizations as to who, who owns what. Uh, well, we make our money creating hypotheticals that ask people to draw lines. And of course, where you draw the line is always a problem. And all these hypotheticals have raised the issue of, you know, where's the line and how difficult it is to come up with a reason line. And the discussion has suggested it's, it's very hard. Uh, but just because it's hard to draw the line, if uh, where you're using this concept called gender stereotyping, if that's a deemed to be an unlawful form of, at least as a prima facie matter, of sex discrimination, just because it's hard to draw the line as to what's gender stereotyping and what isn't, doesn't mean, hasn't convinced me that gender stereotyping is a bad doctrine. I think it's a good doctrine. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it is a part of whatever it means to discriminate on the basis of sex. And the fact that I have a hard time drawing the line doesn't mean I want to throw out the concept. I just say, okay, I, I have a hard time drawing the line, but... I still would, I don't want to throw out the whole concept just because it's difficult to, to very carefully unpack where the line is so you fall on one side or the other. I mean, I was just thinking in, in light of your hypothetical, you know, what if one of my colleagues came to class in a t-shirt and shorts? I don't care whether it's a male or female. Doesn't matter. Okay, during the regular semester, not in the summer. My gut reaction as an old guy is I, that doesn't sound right to me. It's not professional. It's not appropriate. 
uh, I don't see that there's any gender thing about that, but that's because of my own conceptions of what's professional and what's proper. I mean, look, my wife told me to get a haircut last night before I came here, and I did, and I got my tie on, you know, because that's what she told me to do, and so I did it. Uh, because I felt, she's told me, and she was right, that I have to be professional. Now, you know, I guess nobody has a problem with the t-shirt and the, sh you know, shorts, but then if I said something else about the drive, I mean, where's the line? I don't know where yeah, I'm told one of my professors intends sometime this semester to wear a coconut bra to class. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh, well. <laughs> you almost have to know the person to know how this, how this is going to play out. Um, I, I hope it's not Irwin, the concept of him wearing a bra. <laughs> It is. <laughs> I think I'm probably closest to Michael on sort of thinking as you pose these hypotheticals, the Oakley natural foods and the, the tattoo about the sort of the limits of anti-discrimination law. Um, I think there may be reasons we, we might want to intercede in those cases. There might be ways we'd want to do it. I don't think anti-discrimination law gets us there. Me Too in a dress is slightly more difficult for me. I, I think you should let him wear it, though I don't think you have to under anti-discrimination law. I think that's maybe been a, um, a, a sort of difficult position that I've taken in the past. Um, but so I, 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 again, I think I'm um, with Michael and thinking that there are things that anti-discrimination law can still get at um, and I think is usefully getting at in, in getting at some kinds of gender identity performance. But um, with regard to the hypotheticals you posed, I, I don't see anti-discrimination law problems. Mm -hmm. I think just going to um, to that issue and to the uh, the idea of me too wearing the dress and some a few, I heard a few people say well just they'll just have to deal with it if anyone if any of the students are upset well it's not that simple particularly for a company um, that is you know that is about making money is about uh, being a profitable business and it is extremely disruptive to the business I would like to say absolutely just make everybody deal with it and let everybody do what they want to do. Uh, but it's not that simple, and it's it's a tough issue for for the employers to handle. I think that that Michael makes a, a good point that we may be be looking for too much from 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 employers as far as finding our identity, and that perhaps we should look elsewhere. There's one um, one issue that I just want to get on the table, and for for purposes of having this session kind of open up the issues, and that's not a an issue that has to do with a, what so much with what someone chooses to wear um, or look like um, in, in terms of what they can control, but those are the, the sets of, of issues that might show up concretely in a, in a hiring, uh, an employer's hiring plan or, or maybe more subtly. And those are, um, th this is the uh, good looks phenomenon. So sh should an employer be able to as apparently most employers do, uh, to, 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 to look for more attractive people and have those uh, and hire and promote uh, those people in, in ways where, uh, that, where there are not as many opportunities for people who don't meet the community norms uh, for good looks. Now, there were a lot of questions, hands up before, uh, but let's sort of start with that and then hopefully we'll have time to get back to some of the other points. Um, yeah, Pat Shin at, uh, from Suffolk University Law School. Um, to me, these, these initial hypotheticals all seem to be getting at the question of uh, to what extent an employer is allowed to treat the employees in the workplace as part of the furniture of the place. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, on the one hand, it's hard to see how anti-discrimination law could speak to that. But on the other hand, it is true that the way you furnish a place can have a real effect on the way people treat each other and view each other in the workplace. So to the extent that choices like that, how to sort of furnish your workplace by way of the way your employees look can affect the way employees look at each other, I think there is a real possibility that, um, that even a, a completely neutral requirement could potentially, I mean, it's hard to say ex ante, but could potentially have, anti, I mean, subordination consequences or other things that might be of concern to discrimination law. So I think it's hard to say without really looking carefully at the social meanings of the particular furniture that is chosen, uh, hard to say that there's no anti-discrimination hook necessarily. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Angela Nwachi at University of Iowa. Um, I wanted to say, I also agree, I think the line is when the definition of good looks or the definition of professional wear um, becomes racialized, where there's a racialized aspect to it. It's like, for example, with Amber Abercrombie and Fitch, right? If your definition of attractive people is nothing but blonde hair, blue-eyed people, 
you've knocked out entire races of people. Also tied in there, I think, are sort of um, you know, uh, gendered issues about what's attractive, maybe long hair versus short hair. And I think that you really do have to unpack the social meanings behind that. And also with your question with respect to professional wear, uh, if your idea of what's professional excludes things that are racialized, so for example, I wear a, a daishiki and a rapa to teach a class, and the students are distracted because I'm wearing African wear, that's racialized in a way that I think constitutes discrimination in the same way that I think that Me Too is wearing a dress. It becomes you know, gendered in a way that's, that I think would constitute discrimination. That they're upset, they're distracted because he's not performing his, his sex or his gender in the way that he's expected to do so. And so I think that do you that's the should do you, do you think we should have to find, though, I mean, one of the questions here is should we have to find some way to analyze it as a gender or race issue or be out of, or, or, or be without tools? I mean, is that all there is, or is there some other um, non discriminatory you know, theory that goes, that's, that doesn't depend on <coughs> discrimination law that gives you a, a good hook? I guess there could be Emily Ho's work, actually, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, doctrine of good faith claim. I, but I think you could also call it race. I think that part of what I, Devin and Me Too have been saying for a long time is that race is about more than just what someone physically looks like. Sex mm -hmm. is about more than just sort of your, your physical appearance. It's also about how you choose to perform your identity. And Yoshino's work that talks about it's okay to be black, it's okay to be Mexican, it's okay to be a woman, but you've got to perform your identity in a way that fits the mainstream. Um, you know, then I think, um, you know, I think we have to re-examine all those social mm -hmm. meanings. I think there's a way to pack it in. That race is about more than just what I physically look, at, look like. It's about how I'm performing my identity on a regular mm -hmm. basis. In the back. Hi, my name, uh, my name is Jean. I'm from China, Shanghai Institute of Foreign Trade, and I study at Duke University. And just now we discussed the food store law school and uh, also the Tatoon case. And many people use the uh, customer preference as a justification. Uh, actually, I had to say that I a little bit disagree. I have two points to support uh, my idea. The one thing is, uh, I agree that uh, for the customer preference, it's not bad or good. But I feel some customer preference we should encourage, but some maybe we should discourage. This is one thing. And for the other, for different, every industry, every business, there are different customer preference. So actually, something not predictable. But now we discuss law. Law is something should be certain, should be predictable, should not change for every industry, every business. So, so at least based on, on, on this argument, I think the customer preference should not be too, put too much emphasis in the legislation of the makeup identity or performance. This is one thing. For the other is, now we discuss the employee or workers. Uh, actually, maybe I think we should expand uh, this picture. Uh, uh, I think maybe everybody can agree that uh, the employee, uh, employer, the employee is the weak party. Actually, I think there is a triangle, three points. One is the employee, the other is the employer, and the third one is the customer. And the customer's interest actually is with the employer. Now, if we emphasize the customer preference, do you think that the employee is even weaker? Because the, uh, the, the, the employee and customer are together. If we, we emphasize customer preference, and the employee <coughs> will be even weaker. So I think if we really use the customer preference as a justification, which is against the legislation of discrimination law or the labor law, or even the, you know, the race or something else. So I think the overall, I think the customer preference is important but she will not put too much emphasis. Um, Barbara Clay, I want to elaborate a little bit on my response to about me to wearing a dress. Um, first, I think that analyses ought to be very contextualized. So I wasn't talking about a generic employer, but Duke University, which is a private employer in the business of selling legal education. Okay, so there's an employer's interest in getting that sold in a way that keeps the customers coming in and keeps them happy and all those things. The customers being law students who are buying this education. So I think you said it was international finance in the hypothetical, is that right? Case? What do you teach me to exactly? <laughs> <laughs> is that close? Okay, so Me Too shows up in a dress 
wants to teach international finance, and the students are upset because it's because even if he's intending to um, have a discussion about gender performance, that's not what they signed up for when they signed up for international finance. They think, but I actually think. I, so my reaction is, let, let them deal with it. I think it's the, the they is me too and the students in this setting, right? Which which not necessarily generalized to another setting. I'm sure me too can find a way to explain that international finance is in fact gendered, um, and <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and 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 so in this setting where there's a fair amount, not unbounded, um, autonomy of the employee, mainly me too, to do his job in a range of ways, and that's itself gendered, of course, he has more autonomy as a male than I do, and I have more as a white person than he does, probably, and so on. So there's these vast social structures that, that constrain autonomy. It still is an employee position where we assume there's a lot of autonomy, and so that's all built into my saying, let him deal with it. Let me too. What if he's a TV it. newscaster? Um, but then there's an employer with a different set of interests, obviously, right, um, in selling a product that is an appearance-based product, isn't it, partly? Right? It seems and to be now, but we could decide that... <laughs> it, it, could we? <laughs> could we decide that that's not an appearance-based product? Yes. We could. We, I mean, it, it seems to me not a completely, imp I don't know if this is right, I mean, I'm not sure I would come down this way, but it seems to me like you could decide that Southwest Airlines can't be love airlines because the essence of their business is getting people from one place to another. You could decide that the delivery of the news is the essence of the business. And that I, I, have to, I have to admit that I only watch the news very intermittently, but it seems to me that the business is appearance and not news anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I'm just coming at it from, I'm sure, the wrong angle. But I don't I don't. Well, the business, that, yeah. I mean, the, I'm not sure that that was I, too I different from Southwest saying. Airlines. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, other folks who haven't had a chance to, to weigh in here. Yes, my name is Daryl Roberts. I'm from uh, Emory University. Um, I want to make kind of two comments. Uh, I've enjoyed serving the panel this morning. Uh, just the, the, one of the, the notion that uh, employees should kind of find another place other than the workplace to kind of find their identity. I, I, the point is well taken, but I think it's also kind of a, it's somewhat of a distortion of the contribution that identity performance is trying to bring to this conversation of, of discrimination. Because employer, employees are not necessarily looking for the workplace as a way to, uh, to find themselves. But they're trying to, to it within the workplace themselves to create an environment where they can be who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's certain, that with, with performance codes uh, uh, and also uh, dress codes, it places certain limits or constraint, constraints on the way in which certain people are able to perform their identity, i.e. women and African Americans or other uh, minor minorities or people of color versus uh, white males and, um, for example, have much more choices in which to enact their identity. Um, for example, with African American women, for example, we talk about um, wearing cornrows is something that's kind of more or less a morphological trait so that but so, in, in, in making that move, the court is in many ways limited, as Rich has talked about, the ways in which African American women can perform their identity in that way. But providing more choices for, uh, for white women to perform their identity in the workplace. So, we, so I think it's really important to look, to look at this, not necessarily in terms of people just trying to find themselves in the workplace, but they're also trying to challenge this kind of cultural you know, dominance that's taking place in the workplace that makes um, white Anglo-Saxon norms what is appropriate for how people are to live and enact their identity. And the other point I just wanted to respond to is this, whether we should use kind of current anti-discrimination law or we need to develop some kind of other laws. I think it's important to, to see the relationship between the law and all <coughs> the community standards as you talk about, uh, Professor Bartlett, or Dean Bartlett. But the way in which, we also have to also see the way in which community standards are also impacted by social movements in society. So anti-discrimination law didn't just happen, you know, just as happenstance. It was a result of social movements, the civil rights movement within this country. 
that helped to make the issue of race become important and also, and also discrimination one that the law had to recognize, which it didn't before. So I think that, you know, we, yes, the law is important and we can work with that, but we also have to realize that the way in which a lot of the judges make these decisions, the way in which these employers act in the workplace is also shaped by what's going on on the ground as, 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 as uh, Devin has talked about. So I think it's really important uh, to, to realize the interaction between all of these, between community standards, the law, and also what's going on on the ground if we're going to help move this law to a way in which, uh, to a place in which it better recognizes the various ways in which discrimination takes place. Great. I think, um, do you want to respond? Oh, I just want to say I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that the, the employers who are the most successful are the ones who find ways to, to integrate those ideas into the workplace, not necessarily to impose a strict standard, but to find a way to incorporate identity to the extent possible within the workplace to allow those differences to the extent they can. I think we've done as much as we can uh, beyond the time we've been uh, allocated, but the purpose this morning was to, to, to lay out some of the some of the issues and to get some uh, audience engagement. Uh, I know that Catherine and Mitu uh, expect this engagement to burst beyond these walls and to continue during the coffee breaks and, and meals and so on. So um, uh, when you when you get an idea that solves all of this, please be sure to bring it back to, to the big group. But uh, thank you very much for your attention this morning and. Uh, Catherine, me too. Is there anything you want to say before we? No, we'll, we'll take a short break, for 10 minutes now, and then we'll be back. Um, um, there's thanks. coffee in the Burton Lounge back where we had breakfast. But don't take too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.